they, and they certainly do ripe the benefits today. Then Yan went for another type of experiment, experience. He went uh, to AT&T Bell Labs, where he later became the head of the image processing research department at what was then AT&T Labs Research. And since 2003, he is a professor at NYU, where he was also the founding director of the NYU Center for Data Science, a major initiative of the university. He was named director of AI research at Facebook in late 2013, and still retains a part-time position at NYU. Uh, it's a dual model that he, he likes, and maybe we can talk about it afterwards. Uh, he received an impressively long list of accolades, and I would certainly not go through all of them uh, today, for his pioneering, uh, pioneering work in machine learning, and in particular deep learning, a technique that has known an extraordinary development in the last few years. And as of tomorrow, Jan will be an EPFL alum, and as every EPFL diploma, he will have to do a little work to get his diploma, and so I just leave him the floor. Thank you, Pierre. That's probably the easiest exam I've ever taken. Um, or maybe not. We'll see. Okay, um, so I, I want to talk about two things. First, uh, this, the title, Self-Supervised Learning, how can we kind of take AI to the next step and machine learning to the next step. And I'm going to start with a little bit of history and a little bit of sort of, you know, uh, state of the art. I'm going to go very fast because I'm quite sure a lot of you are very aware of what's going on in deep learning. So I'm not going to explain anything because I assume, you know, this could be a bit of a joke by numbers. Um, but, it's, you know, the history I think has uh, a little bit of interesting points. So, um, the interesting thing about AI today uh, which is that there is interesting parallels with uh, aviation in the sense that a lot of people working on AI are inspired by, by nature, by biology. And that was true also of uh, pioneers of aviation. So, you know, the existence proof of uh, heavier than air flight is, uh, is birds. And uh, early pioneers of, of aviation tried to reproduce either birds or bats. And the ones that tried to copy birds and bats too closely failed. Uh, or partially failed, most of them are not remembered. Uh, the ones that had more of an engineering systematic approach of actually experimentation and everything um, succeeded because what they were doing was trying to understand the underlying principles behind flight, which uh, govern flight, the flight of birds and airplanes uh, at the same time. And most of them were tinkerers. And so aerodynamics was not fully developed until after the airplanes was invented. Um, and you know maybe the same thing will happen with intelligence. So. Inspiration by, you know, from biology is useful, but it's dangerous. If, if we get blinded by um, uh, you know, trying to copy all the details of biology in the hope that we're going to uh, reproduce the effect without really understanding the underlying principles, it's, it's probably not going to work. Um, and the example, the best example I use here is this um, airplane here. So I'm sure some of you here are French. So if you're French, you probably have heard maybe of Clément Adair. If you're not French, you probably never heard of this guy. Um, and you know he built this bat-shaped airplane, which you know took off from, on its own power, uh, flew for about 50 meters, about this high, and crashed. It was it was not really controllable. Uh, and there is a reproduction of uh, one of his airplanes here at the uh, Musée National du Conservatoire des Arts et Métiers, Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers in Paris. It's a technology museum. It's fantastic. I encourage you to go there if you go to Paris. Um, and so he's completely forgotten for two reasons. First of all. You know, he copied biology a little too close. The second thing is that he, he was kind of the opposite of the open source guy. He kind of kept everything secret. He only showed this to the military. Um, he has one um, legacy, which is that he named his airplane l'avion. And that's, the, as you know, the French word for airplane. That's his only legacy. Um, Actually, that's not true. He, he actually was an inventor, and he came up with like you know color photography and all kinds of stuff. But um, but that's interesting. So uh, you, you know, AI today really is machine learning, and machine learning today really is deep learning, and deep learning today really is supervised learning. So supervised learning, you know what it is. You want to train a machine to you know classify airplanes from cars. You show it an example of an air, of a car, and if it doesn't say car, you tune the parameters, the knobs here on the machine so that the output gets closer to what you want and you know then you show an airplane and you do the same and then you keep doing this with thousands of examples and eventually things work out and that works really well for situations where you have lots of data that has been labeled by humans uh, so you can map you know speech to words for speech recognition images to categories uh, 
portraits to names, uh, uh, you know, generate photo captions, you know, things like that, right? Supervised learning really works. It's, you know, 95, 99, you know, some number of percentage of applications of machine learning and AI are based on supervised learning. And deep learning, of course, as many of you know, is the simple idea that uh, we're going to build this machine, this parameterized machine, by cascading a bunch of modules, all of which are parameterized and all of which are trainable. And the, the previous way of doing machine learning really was to um, basically handcraft a feature extractor and then plug your favorite, you know, statistical learning algorithm of some kind, uh, a simple one, like linear classifiers or support vector machines. Um, and the idea that you should learn the entire task from end to end so that the machine learns to represent the data and, and learns to kind of process the, the data in a hierarchical way since very natural a posteriori, it took you know, about 25 years to convince the machine learning and computer vision and natural language processing communities that this is a good idea. Um, I still don't understand why it took so long, but it did take very long. Um, so, of course, you know, inside of a, a modern deep learning system, we use neural nets and neural nets, uh, or something akin to neural nets, it's actually more general than this uh, today, but they're basically a successor, succession of linear operators and, and pointwise nonlinear operators, right? So, represent your input as a vector or, you know, a list of numbers of some kind, and multiply it by a matrix, all the coefficients there are the things you're going to tune, then pass the result, the resulting vector through a bank of nonlinearities. The ones that people use nowadays are, are those values, so it's half-wave rectification for the engineers among you. Um, and then you stack, you alternate those, those layers, and you train this with supervised learning, you minimize some objective function that, you know, measures the discrepancy between what you see and what you get, using stochastic gradient descent, to compute the gradients, to use backpropagation, uh, you know, a very sophisticated concept derived from the incredibly sophisticated mathematical concept of chain rule, um, and, um, and boom, it works. And the, the very idea that it works, you have to, there's a little bit of black art in making it work, and I'm sure many of you are aware of this. Nowadays, that's all implemented in all the software platforms that you can download to train those systems. Uh, but back in the old days, you know, there was no open source, there was no common platform that people would share, there was no Python, there was no, nothing like that. And so, it was very difficult for people to kind of start from scratch. A lot of people would start implementing neural nets, either make a mistake or not know all the tricks, it wouldn't work, and then they would say, neural nets don't work. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Okay, um, but we're past those days. So next question, of course, is that you have to put some structure in, in those networks if you want them to work appropriately for things like images. You're not going to multiply all the pixels of an image by a gigantic matrix. And so that's what led to the idea of convolutional net. What led really to the idea of convolutional net was, again, biology, inspiration from biology, the architecture of the connection of the neurons in the visual cortex. Uh, and this is drawn from very classic work in neuroscience by Hubel and Wiesel from the late 50s, early 60s. Um, so classical that it's Nobel Prize winning. Um, and, you know, there were, <clears throat> uh, you know, early pioneers like Kuniko Fukushima who came up with the neocognitron model, which was essentially inspired by Hubel and Wiesel, and he built a computer model that was able to recognize simple shapes, but he didn't have backprop. So he had to use some sort of competitive and supervised learning algorithm that was very brittle. Um, so my contribution to this in the late 80s was to basically train uh, an architecture of this type, uh, which was greatly simplified from, from uh, Fukushima, actually, um, and, and train it with, um, with, with backprop. And that's what a convolutional net really is. So it's got now three types of operations. Uh, convolutions, which are really a linear operator. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of engineers here, a lot of people doing signal processing, so I don't have to explain what a convolution is. Um, then the nonlinearity, and then there is another operation called pooling, which uh, basically aggregates the response of uh, each of the convolutional filters within an area. So when you look at a convolutional net in action, you get this, uh, this is, you know, from the early 90s. You show a character at the input, and then you have all the layers uh, from left to right. And as you go up the layers, uh, there are a feature extraction that generally expands the dimension of the representation and then a pooling operation that uh, reduces the resolution. Um, and then you repeat the operation again, uh, extracting features, passing that through nonlinearities, and then reducing the resolution using this pooling operation. And every time you do a pooling, you basically eliminate a little bit of information about the position of where the features appear, and that builds a little bit of you know, distortion and shift invariant, which is what you want for shape recognition, really. 
Um, so as you go up the layers, the representation becomes more and more abstract, more and more invariant to the things that you don't care about. Um, and it's all trained with, with backprop. It's very simple. Um, so there is a lot of uh, connection also between this and something that is very popular here at the PFL um, called Wavelet. And you know the, this idea of sort of multi-resolution representations. The difference here is that it's nonlinear here. Uh, and then there is kind of things that are a little in between that sort of inspired by neural nets are nonlinear, but also have a lot to do with wavelets uh, called scattering transforms. So this is work by Stefan Mala and many of his collaborators. Uh, it's very interesting and it has some theoretical properties. <coughs> Okay, so, so pretty early we figured out we could recognize not just single characters but multiple characters, which means we could use those systems by essentially taking a convolutional net and kind of swiping it over an input with a sliding window. And in fact, doing this is very cheap with a convolutional net because it's just convolutions all the way, so you just run the convolutions over the entire image. Um, and that made us realize that uh, you can use those convolutional nets not just for recognizing individual objects, but for doing simultaneous segmentation <coughs> and recognition. And I hope I'm not losing my voice before the end of the talk. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so, <coughs> so that allowed us to do things like uh, build um, uh, character recognition systems that were actually practical and were widely deployed by the mid-90s. And, uh, and the mid-90s was just about the time that the whole machine learning community lost interest in neural nets. So after 1996 or so, and until about 2006, it was very hard to actually publish a paper that even mentioned neural nets in conferences like NIPS. <coughs> um, but those things worked. So uh, a few years later, when I uh, left um, um, industry and joined uh, NYU, I kind of decided I was going to go back to actively working on, on those things. In the meantime, I'd worked on uh, image compression and other things. Uh, and try to convince the machine learning community that, that uh, neural nets actually worked um, through the release of open source code and demonstrations of good performance on various data sets. So I got associated with Yoshua Bengio and University of Montreal and uh, Jeff Hinton, where I had done my postdoc at University of Toronto, and we started a conspiracy, essentially, funded by you know, the, the Canadian Foundation, to uh, basically create a small community of people who had that uh, idea, and, um, and that's one of us came up with the name Deep Learning. I can't remember who. A journalist once contacted me, asked me, so you hired a, you know, like a public relation uh, you know, company to kind of come up with a name and like publicize it? And no, 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 it's, we don't even know who came up with it. Um, <clears throat> so one of the first projects I, I did when I restarted working on this was on object recognition, but also another one on robotics, because I thought robotics might, have, might be a, I was always fascinated by robotics, and I thought it would be a good application of this. So one thing we did was build a little uh, mobile robot <clears throat> Um, another topic that's really popular at the PFL. And uh, we trained it, uh, basically we fed the, the camera feed to um, a convolutional net and had the convolutional net watch the steering angle that a human would uh, produce by driving the robot around avoiding obstacles. And then we just trained the convolutional net to predict the, the steering, steering angle that the human driver would produce with about two hours of data or so. Um, and this was analog cameras, the computer was remote. And this is a short video of this uh, little uh, robot driving itself around in this uh, very messy New Jersey backyard, um, <coughs> avoiding various obstacles. Um, so we showed this to a bunch of people at DARPA, and, and which is one of the funding agencies um, in the US, and they say, oh, that sounds really interesting. Let's use machine learning to drive robots. So they started another program called Lagger, Learning Applied to Ground Robots where they had this robot here on the top right built and they gave the robot to a bunch of different teams uh, uh, across the US mostly. And we decided to use those convolutional net ideas to train the convolutional net to label every pixel in the image as to whether it's traversable or not. Um, and the beauty of this is that we could, we could rely on the fact that the, the labels were actually free because 
when you drive the robot around, you can use uh, stereo vision to do a sort of a 3D reconstruction of nearby, the nearby environment up to about 10 meters. Uh, so you can tell if something sticks out of the ground or not using stereo vision. So we collect those labels. This is the, the column here in the middle. And we use those labels to train a convolutional net to tell us whether something is uh, an obstacle or not an obstacle. And it's one of those convolutional nets that takes a window over the image and we swipe it over the entire uh, uh, image and it tells us for every pixel whether it thinks it's traversable or not using the context. Um, so the result is what you see on the, on the right here and uh, that robot, um, so it's a, a kind of a thin convolutional net if you want that, are very wide and, and not tall. Uh, it runs at about one frame per second on the robot itself and it sort of labels the entire environment and then that can be put in a, in a, in a map centered on the robot in which we can do some planning and then you know, plan around obstacles. Um, <clears throat> the map has you know, higher resolution close to the robot and lower resolution far away. Uh, and uh, uh, and they, they, there's a need for multi, multiple vision systems, some of which run at faster than one hertz. Uh, so we had kind of a lower resolution uh, uh, stereo vision based uh, system for avoiding unexpected obstacles that uh, appear uh, quickly. Like for example, uh, annoying grad students jumping in front of the robot. Um, they are allowed to annoy this robot because they are the ones who actually wrote the code and trained it. Uh, Pierre Semenet here works at Google uh, now in uh, robotics and Raya Hetzel leads the robotics group uh, at DeepMind. Um, so soon we realized we could use this not just for uh, segmenting traversability but also for labeling every pixel in an image uh, with the category of, of the object it belongs to, like uh, you know, is it uh, the street or the sidewalk or uh, a building or a, a tree or the sky, etc. And so we trained this system, we actually even implemented it on a FPGA, um, managed to run it at about 20 frames per second. This was around 2010, 2009, 2010. Um, <clears throat> we beat the record on uh, the standard data set that people use in computer vision for this uh, task, um, not only in performance, but in accuracy, but also in speed by about a factor of 50 using no hardware acceleration, and by a factor of a few hundred with a hardware acceleration. Uh, submitted a paper to CVPR 2011. Um, pretty sure it was going to be accepted as an oral presentation and it was soundly rejected by all three reviewers who basically, you know, in their review said like, you know, we don't know what a conventional net is and we can't believe that a method we never heard of could work so well. It's not what they wrote, but that's what they were thinking probably when they wrote it. Um, now the interesting thing is now you know, three years later, you cannot get a paper accepted at CVPR unless you use convolutional nets, which is equally crazy. <laughs> um, so that got a few people thinking, uh, particularly uh, some companies that early on started to build vision systems for cars. Mobileye is one of them. Uh, it's a company, Israeli company that now belongs to Intel. And they use this idea of uh, semantic segmentation for, for autonomous driving. And you know, since then, companies like NVIDIA kind of uh, started working on this. But I'm jumping ahead here. Really what happened is in 2000, uh, the end of 2012, our friends from University of Toronto um, managed to uh, implement a really efficient, very large scale version of commercial nets on GPUs and uh, managed to train this for a few weeks uh, on the ImageNet dataset, which was kind of the new standard from the computer vision community. Before that, the datasets were too small for convolutional nets to really work. There were several attempts by my lab and a couple others to get good results on things like Caltech 101, etc. But Caltech 101 has 30 training samples per category, and convnets just don't work in that, in that situation, not very well at least. We could get very close to state of the art, but not really beat it. But with this, uh, the state of the art was beaten by a large margin. So uh, the previous uh, uh, error rate, this is called the top five error rate on, uh, on ImageNet in 2011 was 26% and then it went down to 16% using this uh, convolutional net from UC of Toronto. And then in subsequent years, uh, various teams sort of embarked on the bandwagon and got you know, the, the error rate down. And now it's better than, essentially, essentially better than human performance on this. Uh, a particular data set. So eventually what happened is that the number of layers of those convolutional nets kind of exploded. So, you know, modern convolutional nets that are used routinely by companies like Google and Facebook and, you know, Microsoft, IBM, just about everybody, uh, uh, have anywhere between 50 and 100 layers. 
Um, and the trick for making this work is this idea of uh, uh, you know, um, residual connections. So you have connections that kind of skip layers so that if one layer dies for some reason, uh, it's kind of a fail safe, the network still kind of survives. <clears throat> so that was kind of critical. The, this was proposed by Keming, uh, Keming He in uh, uh, 2015 um, at Microsoft Research Asia. Keming actually since then joined Facebook. And, um, and that kind of changed a lot of what, we, what you could do with, uh, with commercial nets. <clears throat> so, you know, when I talk to theorists, um, you know, back in the old days, um, the, the argument was, why do you need multiple layers? You know, it's not really necessary. We can prove that you can approximate any function as close as you want with two layers. Uh, even with two layers, where the first layer is not even trained, like, you know, you can set it to random values, or you can, uh, you know, random projections, for example, or you can uh, uh, set it to, set all the weights to um, training samples, which is the case for a kernel machine on SVM. Why do you need the layers? And um, it was very difficult to convince people they actually needed layers. Um, you know, in the end, it's just the results that speak for, for themselves. Uh, and the reason you need layer probably is because the world is, in, you know, compositional. Um, the, the visual world is compositional, but pretty much every natural data that has structure has structure because it's compositional. It's true of the physical world, and it's true of, it's true of the perceptual world, and it's true of almost everything. It's totally true of language. So compositional means that uh, objects are formed by parts of objects, parts of objects are formed by motifs, and motifs are formed by combinations of edges. So this is, you know, this idea of hierarchy and multi-resolution hierarchy is really crucial, um, the concept behind this. Um, okay, but there is a problem with supervised learning, which is that you need lots of data to train it, and it's not very generic, right? You need to kind of retrain your commercial net for every application you have. So one experiment that people at Facebook uh, have, have done, uh, this is not work I'm directly uh, involved in, is take a whole bunch of images from Instagram, 3.5 billion images from Instagram, and train a commercial net to not predict the category of the objects, that you know, are human labeled, but only predict the hashtags that people type when they post a, a, a photo on Instagram. So what they did was select the 17,000 or so most frequent uh, hashtags that are typed by people that correspond to physical concepts, like you know, vis visual objects if you want. Uh, and they trained a commercial net on 3.5 billion images to predict those, uh, those, uh, those hashtags. And then what you do is you take this neural net, you chop off the last layer, and you retrain either the last layer or retrain the entire network on one of the standard data sets like ImageNet or, or Pascal, VOC, or one of those. And this is the result you get here on the right uh, when you do this with ImageNet. This is the uh, absolute record on ImageNet now, so it's 84.12% uh, top one correct. A different measure than the one I showed uh, before. And it's obtained by pre-training on 3.5 billion images to predict hashtags, chopping off the last layer, and then retraining on ImageNet a little bit. So that's not self-supervised learning yet. It's kind of weekly supervised transfer learning. You could think of it this way. Um, and just to complete on the state of the art in, uh, in um, uh, computer vision, uh, one of the latest works at uh, Facebook is uh, one of those kind of sliding window convolutional net that can apply to an entire image uh, and then sort of find region of interest. And this uh, uh, convolutional net, conceptually very simple architecture, is trained not just to produce a category for every location, but it's trained to also produce a mask of the object that it, it thinks it recognizes. And so you combine all of those masks and scores, uh, you know, with uh, some sort of uh, combination at the end, and what you can generate is a mask of every object that appears in the image, something like this, where you, know, you can count how many people there are. So it's not just that there is a big blob with people, there's actually seven uh, persons, you know, baseball bats, a dog at the bottom, things like that. Um, you can detect, uh, you know, wine glasses and, you know, TVs in the back, the wine bottle, the people, the table. Uh, we haven't tried with fondue pots, but, you know, might work. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, uh, you know, segment uh, backpacks and uh, count cars and count sheep. Um, so it's pretty amazing how it works. And it works so well that you can, uh, there is a lot of work now on trying to kind of compress those networks to sort of minimum size by quantizing the weights, by computing it with very low precision, um, so that you can run them in real time on mobile devices. What I'm going to show you now is a video of one of those systems that have been trained to detect key points on human bodies. So you can reconstruct the pose of a human body. And this runs in real time on a smartphone. This is actually a video directly lifted off a smartphone. So it runs at that speed. 
Um, so the, the amount of engineering going into this now, it just never stops to amaze me. There's a huge number of people kind of trying to, you know, build hardware, build better software platforms, finding tricks to kind of optimize those things. There's a, a huge amount of effort going into this. Um, you know, at Facebook, at Google, at uh, all the hardware, uh, the hardware companies, you know, the Nvidia, Qualcomm, Samsung's of the world, Intel. Um, now here is the thing. Uh, the principle on which Facebook AI research is based is open research. There's a lot of AI R&D going on at Facebook, but FAIR, Facebook AI Research, is the part that does open research. So we are completely connected with the international research community. We publish everything we do, generally really quickly, and uh, we also publish all of our code in open source. And the system I just described that can do uh, object localization segmentation is open source, and you can just download it and play with it. Um, and you can also do so with uh, this other project which uses uh, some parts of uh, Detectron here that can uh, essentially estimate the pose of human body to very high precision in real time. So this is running on a single GPU in real time. Um, there's now a mobile version also. And that allows you to do, you know, funny things like remove people's clothing and stuff. Okay, so this was all about pixels, but you can use conventional nets for other things, in particular for text, for example, for translation. Uh, and this is, you know, I'm not going to go into the details of this. This is a system that was built at Facebook to do translation, and it's, you know, evolving all the time. Um, so, you know, you can think of uh, text as kind of a sequence of symbols. You can turn it into a sequence of vectors, and then that becomes something you can run convolutions on. Um, and the cool thing about this is, again, there is a huge problem uh, on Facebook, which is that, you know, we want to be able to translate any language from any other language that people use on Facebook. And people use, you know, maybe 5,000 languages on Facebook or 7,000. And, you know, we don't have parallel text from, you know, Urdu to Swahili or something. So, um, how, you know, how do we, you know, translate from any language to any other language? Uh, it would be nice if there was a way of uh, training translation systems with very f little or no parallel text. And in fact, amazingly enough, that's possible. So what you do is you take a piece of text in one language, you run uh, what's called an unsupervised embedding algorithm. So for those of you who know what word to vec is, that's kind of similar, um, but it's a little more sophisticated than that. And you, you find a vector that uh, basically uh, encode each word or each group of words that are corresponding to what context it can appear in. So now what you have is that a language is a cloud of points, right? A cloud of vectors. And now you have a cloud of point for one language, a cloud of point for another language, and if you can find a transformation that will match those two clouds of points uh, using some distance, perhaps you'll find a way of translating one language to another. And in fact, that actually works, amazingly enough. So you do this and you get you know, different shapes of cloud of points, but there is some commonality between them, which makes it so that you can transform one into the other with a very simple uh, transformation and, uh, and build essentially what amounts to dictionaries or translation uh, uh, tables from one language to another without ever having seen uh, parallel text. So this is uh, work done at uh, Facebook Air Research in Paris and New York. Um, uh, the first author is Guillaume Lample, who is actually a resident PhD student at Facebook Air Research in Paris. Um, this won the best paper award at EMNLP, I believe. Um, <clears throat> okay, lots of applications of the ConvNets, um, including in science. So there is a, a very interesting, since we are near Geneva here, there's a whole bunch of people in Geneva at, at CERN who actually are, are using convolutional nets now to analyze uh, particle trajectories and are, are trying to kind of, you know, train them to filter you know, trajectories to discover new, new physics and new particles. Um, but there's lots of other applications to other areas of science that I think are absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, um, so I think we're going to see a lot of applications in transportation, obviously, in medical image, image, uh, uh, image analysis. Uh, there's a huge amount of work on this. Uh, deep learning and commercial nets are kind of the hottest topic nowadays in, uh, in, that, uh, in that field. But here's something I want to mention. Um, not just because Pierre is in the audience, but, uh, <laughs> but also because I think it's really uh, a very interesting development. It's the idea that you can apply convolutional nets to more domains than just uh, arrays of numbers, if you want. So an image, you can think of it as kind of a regular grid, um, and you can think of this as kind of a graph, uh, which is on a regular grid, where each pixel is a value attributed to either a node or, or, or an arc uh, on, on, this, uh, on this graph. 
but what if the data comes to you in the form of an irregular graph or a, a, a non-Euclidean graph, you know, something that has some curvature to it, like a sphere or a 3D object or something like this? Can you run convolutional nets on this? For example, you know, I give you the 3D mesh representing a human body, and I'll give you the list of points that represent the hand. Can I train a convolutional net to re re recognize that this is a hand, regardless of orientation and conformation? And it turns out you can. And there's a number of different concepts. So one of the first ones that uh, uh, was proposed is, um, <clears throat> and this draws on a lot of you know, classic work uh, in uh, uh, graph signal processing, in which you know, Pierre is uh, one of the uh, pioneers, um, where um, uh, you know, if we can do convolutions on graphs, that means we can do convolutional nets on graph. Uh, you can define what a convolution is on an irregular graph using spectral graph theory, and, um, and, and there's kind of lots of interesting applications of this for social graphs, for social networks, regulatory networks in biology, functional networks in neuroscience, for example, 3D shapes, etc. Um, so I was fortunate enough to um, uh, be a co-author on this uh, review paper with uh, Michael Bronstein, Jean Bruna, Arthur Schlamm, and, and Pierre um, that appeared uh, just uh, last year. And that, that kind of reviews a little bit all the techniques that are relevant for this. And I find this area extremely promising. There's people trying to use this for chemistry, for example, so trying to represent, for example, a molecule as a graph, and then uh, trying to figure out are those two molecules going to match and you know going to stick together. Uh, this could be used for drug design. This could be used for all kinds of stuff. So I'm really excited about, about this area uh, um, of work. And there's sort of several versions of this, depending on whether the, the graph is regular, which is a classical convolutional net, whether the graph is irregular, but fixed, um, you know, which some have called spectral convolutional nets. And then the, the more uh, kind of advanced and interesting version where the graph is, you know, changes for every data point. But you can still apply a constant convolutional net with the same convolution kernels if you want. Um, there's a, we, we, um, some of us uh, from that paper and, and others uh, co-organized a workshop at the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics a few months ago. Uh, where the URL is here, and there's a bunch of videos, um, you know, some of them tutorial about uh, about this, which I encourage you to um, to watch if you're interested in this. Okay, so that's um, you know that was supervised learning basically, <clears throat> but what about Reinforcement learning, that's a really exciting subject, right? Reinforcement learning, we can train machines to play Go and beat, you know, all humans, uh, and not kill all humans, just beat all humans, virtually. And it does work really well for games. So, it's, um, you know, people are working on StarCraft, doesn't work yet, but, you know, it starts, it works really well for things like Doom, um, so you can, you know, kill demons and, and beholders and whatever they're called. Um, Using reinforcement learning works really well for Go and chess and various other games like that. But the reason it works for games and not really for much else is that it requires many, many trials. So it only works in situations where you can have lots and lots and lots of trial and errors. And there's only a few situations where that works. Uh, some online services, like figuring out you know, whether to place ads and stuff, you can try. And if it doesn't work, you try something else. And you can use reinforcement learning for this. But it doesn't really work for, for example, uh, training a, a car to drive itself, um, as I'll show you in a minute. <clears throat> Um, so, uh, AlphaGo uh, from our friends at DeepMind was uh, a very, uh, very good demonstration of uh, deep learning. Uh, we have a version of uh, something a little similar called uh, Elf OpenGo at uh, Facebook. The difference with the DeepMind system is that ours is open source, so you can just download it and play with it, modify it, etc. And it's used as a basis of a lot of Go players now. Um, and it, you know, it works, uh, it works, it works really well, and it, it beats uh, professional players. And it's not as good as AlphaGo because it doesn't use. You know, unless you have a room full of GPUs, you're going to have a hard time, but, um, but, but it works. Uh, we're also working on StarCraft. DeepMind also is working on StarCraft. And this is an example of a strategy, or uh, I should say a tactics, that was learned by the red team using reinforcement learning to encircle another team to kind of collaborate from all sides. Um, we had just, you know, it's still very difficult to do the, the whole strategy thing, but, um, but we're working on it. So here is uh, an example of what the problem with reinforcement learning is. Uh, this is a uh, relatively recent paper from, uh, from, from DeepMind where they, they tried to come up with a technique to accelerate learning uh, on Atari games, you know, classic Atari games from the 1980s. And the problem there is that it takes the equivalent of about 100 hours of play 
for uh, the reinforcement learning, the best reinforcement learning methods that, that we have at our disposal to learn to play an Atari game to the same level that a human can reach in about 15 minutes. So what that tells you is that we're missing something very essential here. You know, with supervised learning, we have to use millions of examples to learn what an elephant is, whereas a little kid can learn this, you know, with just a few examples in your picture book. And in reinforcement learning, we need, you know, hundreds of hours of training to learn a simple game that a human can figure out in, you know, a few minutes. Uh, so what's going on? We're missing something very important. And the result is that we can't use those techniques as they are now thought uh, to do things like, as I was saying, train a car to drive itself. Because, um, you know, it would have to run off a cliff about, you know, a few thousand times before it figures out how not to do that. Uh, and, you know, you might be able to do this in simulation, but certainly not in real life. How is it that humans can learn to drive a car in about 20 or 30 hours of training, or land on airplanes for that matter, um, without ever crashing for most of us? Um, you know, obviously, we, we, we're using other things, right? Um, okay, so what is that other thing? So before I get to that, um, here's a very quick list that I'm going to flash on various open source projects that have been uh, released by Facebook AI Research. Probably the best, uh, the most well-known one is PyTorch, uh, which actually just went to its uh, 1.0 uh, release just a few days ago. Um, and uh, this is the deep learning framework that we use um, at Facebook that uh, people also at other companies use. Uh, not so much Google because they have TensorFlow, but everybody else, essentially. Um, <clears throat> at least in research. And, and now, it used to be that PyTorch was largely a, a, a kind of research and experimentation tool, uh, which had the advantage of dealing with dynamic graphs really easily. Um, <clears throat> But now, with the latest release, it actually can be used also as a production uh, system. So you can train a, a neural net using PyTorch, uh, very convenient, flexible, but you can also just uh, produce a piece of code that will run without uh, requiring a Python runtime. All right, so what are we missing to get uh, machines to learn uh, properly? So current deep learning methods enable us to, you know, have safer cars, better medical image analysis systems, you know, adequate language translation that makes mistakes but is still useful, useful but really stupid chatbots uh, or, you know, digital assistants, I mean, uh, virtual assistants. But we cannot have machines with common sense. We can't have intelligent personal assistants. We can't have smart chatbots. We can't even have household robots that will, you know, empty or, or fill up or, or dishwashers. And, you know, our smartest machines now have less common sense than a house cat. So what's missing are two things, really. One is the ability, and this is for kind of high-level intelligence if you want. One of them is the ability to marry deep learning with reasoning, which I'm going to allude, allude to very briefly. And the other one is the ability of uh, machines to learn background knowledge about the, the world by observation without linking it to any task, okay? And that's what I call self-supervised learning. So, or at least the way to solve that problem is what I call self-supervised learning. So, um, so the first thing, uh, there is a concept that has sort of emerged over the last uh, few years um, that people have called differentiable programming, and that might be the ticket to kind of marrying reasoning and uh, deep learning. Uh, you know, one key idea in there is uh, the idea that, you know, you may have a neural net, a recurrent net, for example, or something like this, but you want to pair it with uh, a piece of memory. Um, and I must say that, you know, one of the first uh, ideas along those lines came out of uh, uh, Switzerland, not uh, very far from here in Lugano. Uh, this is the LSTM model from uh, Ochheiter and uh, Schmiedeber. Uh, uh, more recently, there has been proposals that are a little more systematic about this. You know, um, uh, essentially, you see the uh, entire system as a recurrent net, which you can think of as kind of a CPU or kind of a computing engine, and then a, a, a differentiable memory on the side, which you can think of as like an associative memory that you can use to store uh, facts temporarily, like a, a working memory or, or episodic memory that, that, you know, that's what neuroscientists use them. In our brain, this is a separate structure. The cortex is kind of the CPU, if you want, and the, the hippocampus is what, consists, uh, what constitutes the short-term episodic memory. If you don't have a hippocampus, you can't remember things for more than 20 seconds. And you can't really acquire new uh, memories. 
Um, and you keep repeating the same thing over and over to the same people, not realizing you already told them, uh, which I find myself in that situation, having given this talk many times. Um, <laughs> um, Okay, so one good example of, uh, of, of this idea of differentiable programming is uh, some work that was done at Facebook Air Research in uh, Menlo Park by uh, 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 Drew Batra and Devi Parikh. Uh, and it's the idea that uh, if you want to ask a question to a machine, like, you know, there is a shiny object that is right of the gray metallic cylinder, does it have the same size as the large rubber sphere? You can't just imagine they will have a generic neural net that will kind of analyze the image and the sentence and kind of figure out the answer. And so what the system does is that it dynamically builds the neural net, dynamically, it changes for every new, new sentence that will compute the answer, right? So what to do is, uh, you know, find the large rubber sphere, find the gray metallic cylinder, uh, figure out what location, relative locations they are, and then compare the two locations, and then you answer yes or no. And it turns out you can train this with backdrop end to end, including the part that actually generates the, the network. And so that, uh, that's pretty amazing, and uh, I think there is a lot of really interesting stuff that can uh, uh, follow from this. And I've led a few people to say, the way we're going to write software in the future is not that we're going to write specific instructions that we know exactly that, what they do. We're just going to write programs that generate neural net graphs, if you want, dynamically, depending on the data. So you can have if statements and all that stuff. Um, but the function of each block is basically going to be determined by, by, by training. And so it's kind of a weakly specified program who uh, is finalized by, by, by training. Um, so maybe it's, you know, there's new jobs in this, uh, in this area, new, new types of uh, programming. An example where AI will create jobs, not destroy them. Um, okay, so um, how do uh, humans and animals learn? How do we learn so quickly with so few examples? So, um, there's a gentleman called Emmanuel Dupoux, he's a cognitive neuroscientist at, uh, in, in Paris, or cognitive developmental psychologist also in Paris, uh, is now actually spending some time at Facebook, and he, um, he has this chart with a few pictures here, so if, if you take, um, you know, babies kind of learn basic concepts about the world in the first few months, weeks and months of life, and if you show the, the scenario that you see here on the top left, you have a, a little car, a little car on, the, on the platform and you push it off, and the car doesn't fall. Of course, you know, it's held in the back, but the baby doesn't see that. Um, if you show to a baby, you know, five, six months old, you know, they look at this and they say, sure, that's how the world works. If you show this to a baby that's about eight or nine years old, uh, months old, sorry, eight or nine months old, they go like the little girl here at the bottom left. Because in the meantime, they've learned about gravity, right? They know that, you know, objects don't float in the air. They, they have to fall if they're not supported. Uh, in fact, uh, Emmanuel put together this chart that indicates at what age basic concepts like, um, so it doesn't have things like, you know, uh, learning that the world is three-dimensional, for example, because that happens kind of too early, really, but uh, things like, you know, uh, picking out faces, recognizing uh, biological objects, like, you know, animate, animate objects from inanimate objects, that happens really quickly. Uh, the notion of object permanence, the fact that an object still exists even if it's hidden from you. Um, uh, you know, stability, support, and gravity, inertia, conservation of momentum, you know, basic uh, intuitive physics that comes, you know, around seven or eight months. So, it's not just humans. Animals also learn a lot about the world just by observation. Um, so, here's a, a baby orangutan here, and this baby orangutan is being shown a magic trick. You know, we put an object in a cup, remove the object, but the orangutan doesn't see this and show the cup to the orangutan, which is empty, and the orangutan <laughs> rolls on the floor laughing uh, because his model of the world was, was violated. He knows that objects don't disappear like that. Um, and he's just a baby. Uh, um, orangutans are almost as smart as we are. Um, you know, their brains is pretty big. And they learn those concepts really quickly, like, like babies. Uh, so, you know, how is it that, that they learn this? You know, we can't do this with machines. <clears throat> you know, we learn that the world is two-dimensional. We learn uh, object permanence. We, we learn, you know, that there are objects in front of others. Uh, we learn that there are objects we can move, others that we can't. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that that we learn very, you know, very, very early. That's what we need self-supervised learning for. So what is the idea of self-supervised learning? It's really the idea that you have a piece of data. Let's 
um, assume this, um, this is going to be like a video clip or something like that, right? So it's going to have uh, a time dimension and perhaps two space dimensions in this case. And we're, we're going to plug a machine on part of this data and we're going to make it pretend that it doesn't know the rest of the data and we're going to ask it to predict the rest of the data. So for example, you can do video prediction. You show the machine the past until the present and you ask it to predict the future, which of course you're going to observe in a minute, right? Um, so you could use supervised learning for this. It's just a form of supervised learning really, but the, the, supervisor, the supervisory signal is the input itself at a different location or time. Uh, you can try to predict the past from the present, infer, you know, get into a room, um, infer what happened, how it got there, uh, you know, predict the top from the bottom of an image or, you know, the part of an object that is currently occluded that you don't see. You can, even if you've never seen my left profile, you can probably guess if you only see the right profile what I look like on the other side. Um, so, <clears throat> So basically, predict everything from everything else. That's the idea of self-supervised learning, not using necessarily any uh, data that has been provided or curated by humans. And so the difference in principle between reinforcement learning, supervised learning, and self-supervised uh, uh, learning is the fact that the amount of information that you give to the machine and you ask it to predict is very different. In reinforcement learning, the amount of information you give the machine is you ask it to produce lots of inputs, like play an entire Go game, and at the end you tell it you won or you lost. Basically, you have just one scalar value once in a while. And so the amount of information you provide to the machine and you ask it to predict is very, very small. Um, in supervised learning, it's a little more because you tell the machine, here is the correct answer for this particular sample. But it's still a small amount of data, right? You have, you have a thousand categories that's equivalent to, you know, 10 bits. Um, in self-supervised learning, you're asking the machine, you'll predict everything you see from everything else you, you see, um, or every part of what you see from every other part, the other part of what you see. So that led me to this uh, slightly obnoxious analogy, which is that um, if, uh, at least obnoxious for people working on reinforcement learning, uh, which is that, you know, if intelligence is kind of a volume represented by a chocolate cake here, a for, a for noir chocolate cake. The, most of the, the bulk of the cake, the genoise, if you want, is, um, is uh, self-supervised learning. The icing on the cake would be supervised learning in terms of the amount of information that you, get, you, you give the machine. And then reinforcement learning would just be kind of a cherry on that cake. Um, so I showed this, I started showing this slide about four years ago, uh, in fact, for a, a talk I gave at DeepMind, and, um, and since then there's been lots of versions of this with, you know, the entire cake covered with sherries and, you know, things like that. But, um, but the point here is, you know, how much information you give to the machine and uh, how much information you're asking it to, put it to, um, to predict. So, in my opinion, there is no chance at all that we're going to reach any kind of level of uh, intelligence with pure reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning will have an important role to play. I want to stress that very importantly, but it's not sufficient. So self-supervised learning really is learning to fill in the blanks, and we do this all the time. We, our, our brains are prediction machines, essentially. So the next revolution in AI will not be supervised, and it will not be purely reinforced either. Um, I stole this concept from Elia Shaifos at Berkeley. Um, <clears throat> and then one question we can ask is really what we are after is machines that have a bit of common sense and could self-supervised learning lead to machines with common sense? So one concept in, uh, uh, in AI from 30 years ago was if we accumulate sufficiently many facts about the world, uh, then they will kind of capture all the you know, complexity of the world, and maybe that's where common sense will emerge. So that was the psych program from uh, Doug Lennett that started 35 years ago, uh, which basically consisted in hiring a whole bunch of people who would spend all day typing facts about the world. Um, it's got millions of them now, and, um, uh, and then perhaps, you know, some sort of general knowledge uh, will emerge from this. I think it's kind of hopeless, because I think a lot of knowledge that we have is not really kind of reducible to uh, rules or to text, to kind of verbally expressed uh, knowledge. A lot of it is perceptual, and I think a lot of it, it needs to be learned, because you know, that's kind of the fastest bandwidth that we have to get information into machines. Um, so, you know, common sense allows you to do things like, if I say, John picks up his briefcase and leaves the conference room, there's a huge amount of information you can infer from this. Uh, you know, you can infer, of course, that, you know, John is probably a man, he's probably at work, um, 
and you know you can picture the conference room and whatever but you can infer things that you take for granted like you know he's not going to fly away from from the room he's not going to disintegrate and disappear he, you know he's not going to walk right through the wall you know it's uh, uh, you know, he's going to walk out of the room, open the door, and once he's out of the room, he's not in the room anymore because an object cannot be in two places at the same time. You know, you, we take this for granted, but we learn this. We learn all those concepts, and we need to, our machines to learn them too. So, so you know, how, how, do we, uh, how do we get this? So, what's, um, th there is another use for, uh, for self-supervised learning or predictive learning. Uh, or you know, learning predictive models using self-supervised learning. So predictive model is this idea that you, you look at the past and the present and you try to predict the future. And what would be interesting would be to predict what happens in the future either just because the world is evolving or as a consequence of your own actions. Because that's what allows you to plan. If you can predict the consequences of your actions, they can predict in advance what's going to happen if you take a particular action. And if this action re results in a bad outcome, you just don't do it. So if you turn the wheel of your car and there's a cliff right next to you, and you can predict that the car, because of your internal intuitive physical model of the, of, of the car, is going to run off the cliff, and then your intuitive model says, I'm going to fall off the cliff and I'm probably going to die, you don't do it. Okay? That's probably what happens, what, you know, what allows us to learn to drive a car in 30 hours without actually crashing. It's our predictive model. In fact, the entire front part of our brain is basically, that's basically what it does. It predicts. It also makes decisions about, as a function of those predictions. So in fact, it's a very classical concept in optimal control that um, you, in optimal control, you have what's called a plant simulator, you know, because in control, people control plants, um, which can be like a rocket or, you know, whatever. And uh, to figure out, to plan, uh, and in classical robotics also, people use this kind of model. Um, you, you run your simulator multiple time steps in the future, and you have some sort of objective function, which is, you know, um, how close is the arm to the object I want to grab? How close is the rocket to the space station I want to reach? Things like that. And then other terms like how much energy I've consumed, you know, how, much, you know, how jerky my uh, motion is, things like that. So that's the objective. So you measure the objective every time step. Um, and then by backprop, essentially backprop to time gradient descent, you can figure out uh, an optimal sequence of commands that will optimize the objective while respecting the dynamics of the system without ever actually running this in the real world because you have an accurate simulator of the world. Okay, so that's, um, um, that's called model predictive uh, control uh, in uh, uh, optimal control. And it's very classical. In fact, they are the guys who basically invented backprop for that purpose. That's backprop two time that they use. It's called the adjoint model uh, method in optimal control, but it's, it's backprop two time, same thing. Um, they didn't realize they could use this for learning. It was only used for planning. Um, okay, so if we have an intelligent agent, we, um, before this intelligent agent generates actions to act in the world, what it's going to have to do, if we want it to be intelligent, is uh, have this kind of world model inside of its, uh, of its head, if you want. And then it's going to have what's called an actor that will generate action proposals to the simulator, uh, and then perhaps you know optimize those uh, those actions so as to minimize the expected cost coming out of a, what's called a critic, which is a kind of little learning uh, device that tries to estimate the long-term value of the objective you actually want to optimize. So a typical run of this would be. Here is the initial state of the world, which is given to me by perception. I'm going to run my simulator. I'm going to infer uh, a optimal um, um, sequence of actions that I can take that optimize uh, a, a cost function. And I'm going to take the first action and repeat the process. So that's called receding horizon uh, model predictive control. So how do we learn this predictive model? Uh, we can learn it by just you know observing the world um, uh, for a time. So Imagine we have some estimate of the state of the world as zero. We have a function that's going to predict the next state. And that function is going to take, is going to uh, uh, try to predict two things. It's going to predict the next state. And it's going to predict also sort of a, a cost, if you want. Um, uh, perhaps that might be useful. It's not necess absolutely necessary if you can compute the cost in a differentiable way. But if you can't, you, can, you, you need to kind of... Uh, 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 compute this as well. And one input to this, uh, to this model is going to be the action that you're taking because the world is going to change depending on which action you take. Now the thing is, um, 
if you have a deterministic model that makes this prediction, it's not going to work because the world is not entirely predictable. So there's some experiment that was done a few years ago by some of my colleagues at, at Facebook where uh, you, know, you try to predict, train a machine to predict a convolutional net, essentially to predict what, you know, how a tower of blocks is going to fall. And what you get are kind of blurry predictions because the system can't really ex exactly predict what's going to happen. And so the, the, the main issue here is the world is not completely entirely predictable and so I can't really have a predictor that's going to tell me what's going to happen in the future because there are multiple things that can happen that are all consistent. So the, the set of, of potential outputs to uh, a predictor is, is not a single point, it's kind of a, a set, if you want, like, you know, represented by this ribbon here. Let's call it a manifold. Um, so, you know, if you want to train a system like this, uh, first of all, if you want it to be able to produce multiple outputs for a single input, it has to have access to a source of extra information, like other variables that you can vary. And that variable would be a latent variable, a hidden state called Z. Um, which is, you know, what you don't observe about the world, or that reflects the fact that the world is intrinsically stochastic. And so, uh, as uh, Z varies, the, the prediction of Y kind of varies along the manifold of potential futures. Now, the problem you have now is that um, uh, you need a, a way to tell whether the... Uh, you, you have basically two ways to approach the problem. One way to approach the problem is to say, I'm observing a particular Y, I'm going to try to figure out the value of Z that predicts this Y. Okay, using inference, using gradient descent, for example. I can try to search the value of Z that produces the Y that I observe. So that's one category of methods, of latent variable methods. Um, and another is to uh, just sample Z at random. It's going to produce a Y, which may be different from the Y that I observe. And now what I have to have is an objective function to minimize that tells me whether the prediction that my model made is on the manifold or outside. Okay? And of course, I don't know where the manifold is, so I'm going to have to train another neural net to tell me if I'm on a manifold or not. Those two categories of methods, the first one is what's called latent variable models, uh, and the second one is basically adversarial training or generative adversarial networks. So uh, latent variable, um, and so I haven't talked about probability distribution here. If you're a probabilist, you say, oh, you know, it's easy. What you do is you get this machine to not just produce a point, but to produce a distribution. Yeah, that's easy enough when the distribution is discrete, but in high dimensional continuous spaces, we don't know how to represent distributions. So what I, uh, what I think uh, we should do, uh, which I've been advocating for a long time, is we should abandon the idea that what we're trying to do is estimating densities because it's not a useful concept in this, in this uh, context. It's too difficult. And it's not even right. In the sense that if our distribution is this thin ribbon here, we need to, uh, this generator will need to, this generator to produce a function uh, that is one on the ribbon and zero outside. It's not one on the ribbon, it's, you know, some infinite value whose, integra whose integral on the whole space is one, which of course we can compute. We can't normalize distribution in high dimensional continuous spaces. And we can't train functions that need to take, you know, zero on one part of the space and infinity on the other part of the space right next to it, because it needs to have infinite weights. So this whole concept of learning distribution is just wrong, okay? I'm, you know, being voluntarily provocative here, all right? <laughs> um, it's not wrong, it's just not what you want, okay? So what you want, in fact, here for this objective function that tells you whether you're on this ribbon or not, you want a smooth function that is zero on the ribbon and increases smoothly as you move away from the ribbon so that when you compute the gradient of that function, it tells you where to go to get closer to the ribbon. And that's not anything related to a density. It's certainly not the log of a density. It's something else. Okay, so that's the idea of energy-based models. Let's forget about probability distributions. Let's just manipulate energies, right? So the energy function is this thing that I mentioned, something that tells you whether you are on the ribbon or outside, on the manifold of data or outside, and it kind of tells you how far you are, if you want. So a way to uh, uh, implement this in an architecture, a very simple architecture, would be something like this, where you have you know, some neural net that you train that takes into account the, the context and a latent variable, um, and then you measure the distance with the the y, so this is not, this is num the, you know, option number one that I mentioned uh, as the energy function. And if I give you an x and a y, what you do is you infer the z that minimizes the, this energy. Uh, and, and that's a measure of the compatibility between x and y. So if you have data points like this, so let's say for a given x, uh, y is two-dimensional, and the points that are observed are like this. For another x, it would be different. 
What I want is a contrast function that kind of looks like this. You know, it gives low values on the points, higher values outside. I don't really care what the shape is, as long as maybe it's smooth and the gradient kind of points in the right direction. So you need the function to be trained to kind of take the right shape. Okay, this overall energy function that computes the compatibility between X and Y. And it's easy enough to train a function to give you low energy on the points that you show it. You show it a point and you say, tweak the parameters so that the output goes down. You know, we, don't know, we know how to do this with stochastic gradient, easy enough. The hard part is how you make sure that the energy is higher outside of the manifold of data. Um, so the green points here, you know, we should kind of push the energy up. So in fact, how to solve this second problem, pushing up the energy of stuff outside the manifold of data, um, is not an easy problem to solve. And if you look through the literature and sort of interpret it in, in those terms, um, I, I kind of found about seven different classes of methods to do so, okay? None of which are perfect, unfortunately. Um, so you can do things like build machines so in such a way that the volume of low energy stuff is constant so that you can just, you know, this sort of energy wells in your machine and you can move them around, but automatically the energy will be higher outside of those energy wells. So things like classical methods like PCA, K-means, uh, gas mixture model, square ICA, they're all within this category. Um, you can push down on the energy of uh, data points and then push up everywhere else. That's what maximum likelihood tells you. It's a bad idea because they push them to infinity. You can push down on the energy of data points and push up on chosen locations in a smart way. Um, and so things like contrastive divergence, ratio matching, uh, noise contrastive estimation, minimum probability flow, all of, the, all of those are kind of instances of this. And uh, another interesting instance of this is generative adversarial networks, which consist in training another neural net, a generator network, to produce contrastive points, okay? So this is the view in which the generative adversarial network picture, which you're training is a discriminator, the thing that tells you whether you are on the manifold or not. And then you use the generator as a way to produce points that are outside the data manifold, essentially. Um, but a very interesting one also is uh, one that uses regularizers that limit the volume of space that can take low energy. That's uh, one of my favorite classes of methods. The others which I'm not going to go through. Um, so uh, these are sort of energy landscapes in two dimension for things like PCA and K-means and where you know, black represents low energy, white higher energy. Um, and, you know, sparse coding uh, can be kind of interpreted in those terms as well. It's a particular type of energy where the decoder is linear and everything, and it has some sort of energy uh, representation that looks like a piecewise uh, approximation of the manifold of data. And then you have sparse autoencoders, which, uh, you know, I've, I used to work on uh, about 10 years ago, where um, you have a regularizer of the latent variable that uh, makes it sparse, uh, but you have some encoder that predicts what the value of this latent variable should be, so you don't have to infer it with gradient descent every time. Uh, and you, tr you train the system so it, it reconstructs uh, data. And with this, you, you produce, um, you know, beautiful, in the convolutional version of this, you produce beautiful uh, filters, uh, which uh, I'm sure people working on Wavelet will recognize. But this is just a result of training a system like this on natural image uh, patches, natural images, actually. So adversarial training, I'm sure a lot of you have, have heard about this. So it's this idea that you train two networks against each other. The discriminator computes its energy function. The generator trains itself to fool the discriminator uh, and trains itself to, and what it needs is, is uh, a discriminator function that is smooth so that it will give it a gradient that will indicate in which direction to change its output so that um, uh, it gets closer to the data manifold. So here the data points are the, the blue points, the green points are what's generated by the, the generator, and the discriminator is trained to give low energy to the blue points, high energy to the green points, and so it does something like this. And then progressively, the generator gets the gradient of the output of the discriminator with respect to its input, and it can change its parameters so, so as to bring the green points closer. And you get this, and you get good predictions out of it. And in fact, if you, um, so there's like amazing demonstration of how this works. This is recent work from uh, NVIDIA uh, of training a, a generator from a source of random numbers to produce uh, uh, pictures of, of people. This is trained on a large database of celebrities, and so those are non-existing celebrities. Um, but they look pretty convincing. Uh, 
And you can use this to do video prediction. So this is some work uh, from, from, from my group at, at Facebook Air Research and at uh, NYU from a few years ago, uh, where we, we trained a, a sort of multi-scale convolutional net to do video prediction, just predict a few frames uh, from uh, four initial frames, predict the next two frames. And if you use just least square to do this prediction, you get the kind of blurry prediction you see at the top right. But if you use this sort of adversarial training idea, you get much sharper prediction that looks more believable. Uh, it's very hard to actually measure objectively the performance of those systems. Uh, you can train it to predict what uh, a New York apartment is going to look like as you rotate a camera. So here at the bottom, you see a, a kind of a, a bookcase. And this is a prediction of the bookcase, of what it should look like. Just looking at the initial four frames, you, you predict the next frames, and it looks like a bookcase. So it's going to capture a little bit of the regularities of what you know, apartments are supposed to look like. Uh, more interesting, you'd like to be able to predict what cars around you are going to do if you're going to drive. So it would be very interesting to be able to, for example, tell that when pedestrians start crossing the street, they're going to keep crossing the street. Because that would allow you to plan ahead and not you know, uh, run them over. Uh, or if the car in front of you is starting to, to turn left, you know, you can probably accelerate because it's probably going to get out of the way. So, um, so something that the autonomous driving system on the Tesla doesn't do very well. If you have a car in front of you that turns left, uh, intuitively you would just keep going because you know it's going to get out of the way. But the, the, the radar system um, and the vision system in the Tesla will actually break because, you know, it can't figure out that the car is going to turn. So. Um, uh, so that, this is work that was done at Facebook Air Research in Paris by uh, 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 Pauline Luc and, uh, and Camille Coupry. Uh, and it allows to predict maybe a couple seconds in the future what's going to happen in a street scene. This doesn't work on the pixel level. It works at the level of uh, segmentation masks produced by mask RCNN, basically. Okay, but here's the last thing I want to tell you about. This is um, uh, uh, another kind of prediction system based on latent variables uh, and, and, and forward models. And this is uh, this sort of early versions of this paper that was published. There is a, a new one that we just finished and submitted to iClear. But he, um, we, we call this a target encoding network. So basically, let's say we want to drive a car. We'd like to know what the car around us are going to do so that we can plan ahead and, and sort of drive properly. And so let's say the state of the world is the position of all the cars around us. OK, we're in the center. And we're going to run this through a neural net and run this through another neural net um, that also takes the action, so whether we're going to turn the wheel, accelerate, or, or brake, and that's going to predict the position of all the cars around us. But of course, we can't exactly predict because the cars around us do what they want, right? So there's going to be a latent variable Z that is going to represent all the stuff that we can predict about the cars around us uh, doing stuff. So that goes into a little piece of a neural net that adapts the dimension of Z into the dimension of the hidden layer here. Of our, of our encoder, and that generates the future, and we can, of course, train this thing supervised to, by comparing it with what actually occurs in the future. Now, here's the problem. Uh, if we have uh, an observation of the past, and then we need to make a prediction about the future, we need to have some good idea of what Z is. And so, what this, what this system, the, the way the system is trained, it, it's got two tricks. One trick is, uh, we're going to try to predict what Z is by observing the, the future, by cheating, essentially, running it through a neural net, and then computing the value of Z. But of course, if that is the case, the system can cheat. It can train the decoder and the fee function to basically just look at the future and then predict the future with the future, right? And so that doesn't work if you just let it do this. And so there's a key concept in there, which is that you have to limit the information content of that Z variable. And the way this is done in this model, you can do this with sparsity or other things, but the way this is done in this model is by basically dropping Z to zero half of the time. So half the time you tell the system, you can't use Z, just take your best guess. And then half of the time you say, okay, now you can use Z and you know, uh, just predict what, uh, what the future will be using Z. And so the system has to force itself to use as much as it can the past to predict the future, but in, in stuff that it can't predict, it's, kind of, it's allowed to use this fee function. Um, and the fee function depends on, on the past as well, so it can be a fairly complicated. All of this is a big neural net. I mean, it's a combination of neural net. So here is the situation. We have cameras looking down at the traffic, and we can segment every car and track them, and we can generate a little image that is centered on every car that represents the surrounding of every car. And we could imagine we could obtain this from some you know, um, uh, sensor data. Um, and so take three frames, run them to a convolutional net uh, with a few layers. Um, and uh, the fee function is at the bottom. 
uh, pre, uh, compute the Z, feed the action, and then decode and predict the next frame. And this is what happens if you do this. So when Z equals zero, you get this kind of prediction, which becomes very blurry very quickly. With, where Z is sampled from examples from the training set, you get those very sharp predictions, and depending on the Z that you pick, you're going to get different futures, right? So now what you can do to plan how to drive is you can run your model with different Z's, see what happens, uh, and then try to run a policy that will make sure you're not going to crash in any of those uh, potential futures. So the cool thing about this is that this is not reinforcement learning because the cost function we're going to optimize is completely computable and differentiable. It's basically how far you are from the cars in front of you and to the side, and you can just compute this. Um, it's just a fixed cost function. You can backpropagate through it. Um, and here is how this works. So uh, once the forward model has been trained, okay, you've trained it before by just observation. You, you don't have to drive. You just have to look at other people driving. So F is known now. Uh, you start with initial state. You run the simulation, you sample Z, uh, you know, randomly in a, in a good set uh, for a few steps. And then uh, you backpropagate gradient through the whole thing so as to minimize the, the cost with respect to the parameters of a network that computes the policy. So this is a network that takes the current state and decides whether to accelerate or brake or turn. But it can use the gradients from the future, from multiple futures, right? So you train this. And you put it in, and it doesn't work. Uh, what happens is the car turns like crazy and goes into places where the forward model is completely inaccurate, uh, and where the cost function basically does not really work. So basically, it runs, it runs off of the highway, you know, and it, it just doesn't work. So what happens here is that the, the system doesn't know if it's, it doesn't use the information of whether its, it's prediction are accurate or not. So there's one fix you have to do. And that fix is to uh, basically run your forward model with a little bit of noise in it. And the way you generate noise in the forward model is by is using dropout. So you sample multiple dropouts. And so you're going to get multiple predictions for the future for a given z. Uh, and you can compute the variance of, that, of those predictions. And that's a measure of uncertainty about the, about the model. That variance is a differentiable function. You, you add that term in the cost function that you optimize during the planning and the, and the learning, and all of a sudden, everything works. So you basically tell the system, don't go into places where you don't know what's going to happen. And if you do this, that's what you get. So here is the car. The little white dot indicates the action, so turning, accelerating, braking. And it figures out, you know, when there is a merging in the highway that it needs to kind of get into in between the cars. That So I have to mention that in those examples, the other cars are actually real cars that are, you know, filmed from this camera. And they have no idea that this blue car is here. So they do as if it's not there. So this blue car has to, has to drive very defensively because, you know, it doesn't exist. Um, and there are some drivers, you know, in some areas of the world which, you know, basically behave like you don't exist. <laughs> okay, so this is my uh, last two slides in conclusion, uh, and I've taken too long, too much, too much of your time, but there's promising areas of research, so I'm uh, going through there again. Deep learning on new domains beyond multidimensional arrays on graphs and structured data and more complex uh, uh, objects. Marrying deep learning and reasoning. Uh, which consists in replacing symbols by vectors and logic by algebra, essentially, or differentiable uh, computation. The self-supervised learning of world models, uh, which can deal with uncertainty in, in high-dimensional continuous spaces using latent variables. There's learning uh, hierarchical representations of control space, uh, which is something I haven't talked about, but it's a huge problem that nobody knows how to solve. Um, how you marry deep learning with you know, planning complex sequences of actions. We don't know how to do that at all. And then we need more theory, and we need compilers for differentiable programming. Um, so a slightly philosophical uh, conclusion is the fact that very often in, in history uh, of, of science and technology, a technology called artifacts has come before the theory that explains it, right? So people started building telescopes and, and even microscopes before optics was figured out. Uh, and optics was invented to basically explain and optimize uh, those artifacts. Uh, 
the steam engine was invented and thermodynamics was developed to actually explain the limitations of steam engine and ended up being the foundation of all of physics. It's one of the most fundamental body of work in, in physics is thermodynamics. Um, uh, the airplane was invented before aerodynamics was fully figured out. Certainly not issues of, you know, uh, um, thrust and drag and and lift and stability. Um, calculators were invented before computer science was computer science. Okay, computer science became computer science only in the 60s or so. And certainly telecommunication was invented before information theory. So. What I'm after, my kind of scientific program for the few years I have left, um, is um, what is the equivalent of thermodynamics for intelligence? Is there a science of intelligence that will kind of subtend uh, intelligence, whether it's artificial, whether it's machine intelligence, or whether it's uh, biological intelligence? Uh, and uh, it's possible that the fact that we're starting to build slightly intelligent machines will allow us to kind of abstract the concepts that really are necessary behind it. And that's my program for the next few years before I go crazy. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Jan. The, the program looks uh, certainly very interesting <laughs> and challenging. Uh, we are running a bit out of time, but let's take some minutes for any questions from the audience. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and we will get a mic uh, to you. Over there. Okay. Uh, so hello. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, so I would like to ask about one thing about your on your slide about um, promising fields. Sorry, on your slide about promising fields uh, in AI, you mentioned mostly about techniques. But what about ensuring the quality and reproducibility of models? Okay. Um, so what about quality and reproducibility of models? Yeah, this is a, a completely different orthogonal set of issues. Uh, there are, you know, serious people who work on this. I can't, I can't claim I do, so uh, don't take my, my word for it. But um, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, who is also a professor at McGill, uh, but also a colleague at Facebook, Joel Pinot, has been doing a lot of work on reproducibility and robustness of reinforcement learning systems. And it's an interesting work that shows that a lot of papers that use reinforcement learning are actually extremely dependent on very, very uh, uh, precise tuning of hyperparameters. And as soon as you change the tiny details in those systems, the results you get are completely different. So that makes it very difficult to do science, to, you know, to claim that a model works better than another. Uh, so there is a methodological issue there, in, uh, particularly in reinforcement learning, because it breaks the traditional model of machine learning, where you, you have you know, a training set and a test set. And you, as long as you keep the, the two apart, then you know, the results you know, might be believable. In reinforcement learning, you have to, you, what the system observes depends on the action it takes. So there has to be an interactive environment. And uh, that makes the whole thing more difficult. Um, and then there are, uh, I think the more important question is uh, testability. So uh, there's a lot of people who are particularly coming from other areas of engineering where you can prove the stability of a controller and things like this. And you say, like, if you use neural nets in your car, how can you be sure it's never going to crash? And the answer to this, probably one answer to this, is not the only one, is, of course, we need more theory. Uh, we, need, you know, we need more guarantees, theoretical guarantees. But uh, another thing is uh, we are very used to... Uh, 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 certifying uh, engineering systems by testing them to death. I mean, or to life. I mean, you know, hopefully not to death. Um, you know, airplanes are a good example, but also uh, uh, medicine, drugs. So when a drug comes uh, on the market, it's, you know, there is uh, uh, trials that are very carefully uh, tested. Uh, the, the, the protocol is, uh, has to be open and the results have to be public for it to be certified. Uh, and most of the drugs that are put on the market, we actually don't have a very good idea of how they uh, operate, of how they act, uh, but we have to test them. So it's a little bit the same here. If, you know, if we might have neural nets for which we don't have guarantees that are completely ironclad, but if we test them thoroughly enough, if we find good protocols to test them, maybe they'll, they'll, you know, they'll be like, like medicine, basically. Yes. Uh, <coughs> you have mentioned that machine learning is very efficient for language translation. Uh, could it be efficient for decoding ancient writings like linear A. Right. Uh, yeah. 
so here is an experiment that the, the, the people at, uh, at Facebook in Paris who worked on this unsupervised translation system did. They took uh, text in Klingon and tried to <laughs> translate it. And it kind of works. <laughs> Right, so Klingon is, is a fake language, right? Um, but there is some structure to it, and you know, someone designed it. So it, it's interesting to see, I mean, one potential application of this would be to figure out, to decode some writings that, uh, that uh, are currently not, uh, not known. Um, so um, you know, a, a recent example of this is the uh, 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 decoding of the Maya language. The Mayan written language was uh, uh, essentially decoded by a, a, a German anthropologist who figured it out, whom I met a couple of years ago. Um, and it's, it's amazing work, but it's very, very hard work, and it's quite possible that you know, statistical methods of this type could help a lot in that context, yeah. Okay, I'm sure there's many more questions, but our speaker needs to ingest some food to sustain his own neural <laughs> networks, so uh, we'll stop it here, and please join me in thanking Jan again. Thank you very much.